it's essentially like describing a dolphin as not having wings, not having legs, and definitely not being a swan. Because with this, considered shy and socially awkward, because he was introverted. A yeah, dude likes hard. books! Welcome to the Autistic Culture Podcast. Each episode, we dive deep into autistic contributions to society and culture by introducing you to some of the world's most famous and successful autistics in history. Before we get started, a quick disclaimer on how we use the word autistic. The purpose of this show is not to diagnose the people or characters we discuss as autistic. While some may have announced being autistic, what we're sharing here is our observation of what is representative of autistic culture. It can sometimes be difficult for autistic people to celebrate our natural tendencies and traits due to the perception of autism as a disorder that needs to be fixed, a long history of damaging medical interventions to try and get us to fit in with mainstream culture, and protective masking skills many of us have developed to try to stay safe. Whether you are autistic or just love someone who is, your host is Dr. Angela Loria, the linguistic autistic. And licensed psychological practitioner Matt Lowry welcome you to take this time to be fully immersed in the language, values, traditions, norms, and identity of Autistica. Autistica. Episode 5, Washington, D.C. is Autistic. Well, hey, everybody, here we are at the Autistic Culture Podcast. You are in the right place if you are ready to hang out with us, because today... I am taking you, Matt, on a tour of my surprisingly autistic town, Washington, D.C. Oh, very are you nice. Ready? Yes. Have I you ever am been? ready and excited. Have you ever been to Washington, D.C.? I actually have not, but given the number of museums, especially with the Smithsonian, <laughs> I really, really want to see it. Yes, it is uh, a special interest dumping ground. So if you ever want to go deep, uh, we've got a museum for that. But that's actually not what I'm talking about today. Well, a little bit, but that's not what I'm talking about today. I'm taking it old school. I'm going to take you back to the creation of Washington, D.C. It was actually formed by two of my favorite autistics from the land of Autistica. Really? So, yes. So, the, a lot of people know um, that... Uh, Pierre L'Enfant, who is extremely neurotypical, um, was uh, a big city planner for Washington, D.C., but they don't always know about our black autistic architect who designed really? all of our streets and the city layout. And I cannot wait to tell you how autistic it is. It's so good. You're going to love it. Um, do you know the most famous black city architect from the 1700s that would bring to mind a a uh, a certain benjamin banneker yes him? nailed it you just passed your third grade civics class excellent all right so i went to biography.com the good folks at biography tv and i got us a little bio of benjamin banneker for the few people who may not remember their third grade civics class can you read us a little bit of Mr. Banneker's bio? I can and will. A free black man who owned a farm near Baltimore, Benjamin Banneker was largely self-educated in astronomy and mathematics. Very cool. He was later called upon to assist in the surveying of territory for the construction of the nation's capital. He also became an active writer of almanacs. Oh, wow. That's cool. And exchanged letters with Thomas Jefferson, politely challenging him to do what he could to ensure racial equality. Okay. So he was an activist back in right. the day. So tell me just in that paragraph all the things you can spot that are autistic. If someone is educated in astronomy and mathematics... Oh, my God. Right? Uh, Wait, no. Yeah. Self-educated. We love a little yes. autodidactic stuff. That's the thing. If anyone does the research to become self-educated in such areas, I think uh, I, I would proudly call them one of us. Yeah. Uh, and become an active writer of almanacs. 
Okay, oh wait, God. I have to tell you this one, because this is where I fell in love with Benjamin Banneker. Lay it on me. Very, well, my very first job out of college was writing espionage books. But my second really? job... Yeah, oh, I can tell you all the spy things. <laughs> ah! My second job was writing almanacs. Really? It's true. I did the almanac of U.S. politics, the almanac of U.S. history. I wrote for the... Um, the people who publish, uh, like the world, the Guinness Book of World Records. Um, so like all the almanacs, like I was obsessed with reading the world records and like memorizing all of them. And then my job was to go to every single Senate and Congress office building and get like the names and phone numbers of the staff because there was no internet. So I was literally the internet before the internet. And so was Benjamin Banneker. That is magnificent. The, the, the acquisition and recording and presentation of data is our jam. That is wonderful. Oh, so good. Okay, so we got autodidactic. We got astronomy and mathematics. We got almanac and then one of my favorite autistic traits what's the fourth one in here justice sensitivity uh becoming Bam. an advocate for marginalized people that is magnificent especially back in the day that took some real real guts to say hey thomas jefferson let's fix that yeah and he really called uh he really called out jefferson but he was actually quite polite, which maybe we're not always good at, but he was hardcore. So he wrote this letter in 1791. Oh, by the way, Jefferson, also autistic. We're going to talk about him in a minute. Jefferson, also autistic, was the one who got Banneker the job. Really? So here's the deal. Pierre L'Enfant, obviously he knows Jefferson for their time in France. He's very ha ha ha. Jefferson is like kind of shy and awkward. Um, so as I'm befitting gonna, our people. Yeah. So like, I'm going to give you this. Tell us a little bit about Jefferson. And this is from Roberta Grimes. She wrote Jefferson, Asperger's and race. Obviously, that book was written at a time we use the word Asperger's. So autism for us. Here you go. Indeed. Jefferson was often considered shy and socially awkward by his contemporaries and was regarded as an eccentric, as we are. His mannerisms were said to be very awkward and odd, and he was even described as having an unusual sitting position, because proprioception is the way of our lives. He also struggled with eye contact, which Alexander Hamilton, his rival, once attacked him for and believed it to be proof that he was a dishonest man. Because ableism is alive and well. Well, was. In 1791. <laughs> exactly. Jefferson was also attacked by his political rivals for apparently being expressionless. What? Having, having resting autism face. Resting autism face, yeah. Yes. And the one that got me was like the um, coming up with proof of the way that we act that we're dishonest. Because yes. I get that one too, and it's so painful. Like studies have shown, yes, studies have shown that neurotypicals tend to make snap judgments about us based on our body language and eye contact. And this is one thing that when I write uh, accommodation letters for people, uh, for schools and for work, I have to explain that because we communicate differently non-verbally, we don't make eye contact. It's, it, it's a very interesting Western colonialist uh, sort of thing. Because elsewhere in the world, eye contact is not a regular thing, but our culture promotes it heavily. And it's fascinating to see that even back then, the eye contact was considered such a major factor that it contributed to political animosity. Yeah. So what I wanted to talk about this description compared to Banneker. So when we looked at Banneker, we're like, oh, he's got a special interest. He's into social justice. And... Um, I know you do strengths-based diagnosis. I do. I, I would say that description of Banneker was a pretty, like, strengths-based diagnosis. Very awesome. This diagnosis of Jefferson, or this analysis of, we obviously, we did not test Jefferson or Banneker. 
uh, Matt has not d sat down with them and done their assessment, but we're guessing from historical facts that they are autistic. But this is sort of uh, kind of the old school way of doing an autism diagnosis here. So what do you see here in this description of Jefferson that's autistic? And I feel like we're trying to get a DSM diagnosis to get our like ABA therapy prescribed and covered by insurance. Exactly. And that's the thing about the deficit model, because again, it's essentially like describing a dolphin as not having wings, not having legs, and definitely not being a swan. It Instead of judging for people or, or accepting people for who they are. Because with this, considered shy and socially awkward, because he was introverted. Yeah, dude liked books, had a exactly. real big library, wanted to read all the books, too busy to talk to you. The library is the life of our people. Yes, that is wonder. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yes, uh, autistic people. We we enjoy information. We enjoy reading. We enjoy data acquisition. And so, this, if you were rewriting this first sentence, the first sentence was Jefferson was considered shy and socially awkward, uh, and was recorded was regarded as an eccentric. How could we say that in a land of autistic a way? I, I would say, again, uh, I, I would say that he was interested in ideas, mm. that he was a, uh, uh, hmm, he, be, well, that's the thing about eccentric. I, I find eccentric people interesting. I, I find eccentric people, anyone who, who has these idiosyncrasies is something that I can dive into and know more about because... For instance, if you see someone walking down the street with a top hat, that is an interesting person. I want to know more about the top hat person than I would with a person who is wearing everything that other people wear. I, I find that a very, very interesting person. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. We love sharing stories of autistic culture. And if you are seeing yourself in any of these stories, and you're wondering if maybe you're one of us or maybe you're already diagnosed or self-diagnosed and you want to know if Matt can help you live your life better and be more authentically autistic. Check out his website at mattlowerylpp.com. That's Matt, M-A-T-T, -T, Lowry, L-O-W-R-Y. And then that L-P-P, -P, it stands for Licensed Psychological Practitioner. So head on over to mattlowrylpp.com and learn more about working with my buddy Matt. If, if he was reserved and interesting, I, I would find him to be delightful. Yeah. Yeah. So, um... Unusual sitting sitting position. You talked about what that, where does that come from? You used a word I think maybe not everybody knows. That would be proprioception. A word which here means awareness of your body's location in time and space. And one of the things that I love about autistic people is that Whereas allistics, non-autistic people, tend to sit with their legs uh, at right angles, butts in the chair, feet on the floor, we are all over the place. Especially when I meet an autistic kid, they're usually upside down in the chair. People might sit on the floor. People might sit on the arm of a sofa. We move around a lot. Even as we're recording here, I will be rocking and swaying and twisting, as is my nature. And... This is a very, very interesting thing. And it's a big, big part about us being autistic because we have to continually move. I often recommend that autistic kids have standing desks or ball chairs. Uh, autistic adults need to have breaks to get up and move around because this is what our bodies need. And we need to continually readjust and have this, what we call vestibular stimulation. Uh, vestibular stimulation means uh, the inner ear. And for those, I guess, who don't know, the inner ear is responsible for balance and all this other stuff. And we can we could be very sensitive to this. A lot of autistic people seek out stuff like roller coasters or uh, may like to drive a fast car because they need this proprioceptive stimulation. 
And it's one of the things that keeps us healthy. And for him to have an unusual sitting position is a big, big indicator that he was one of our people. I love it. I love it. So I want to dive into this connection between Jefferson and Banneker. So Jefferson's working with L'Enfant. It's taking forever. He's getting super frustrated. Everything looks real pretty, but it's a little disorganized. And he's like, who is the guy I know who could come in and organize this chaos, put some linearity, put some structure into it? He's searching his Rolodex, I'm sure his 1791 Rolodex. He's like, who do I know that would be awesome at this? And out of all of the people in the world, he picks another autistic. Obviously, he didn't know that. Banneker wasn't wearing an autistic shirt. But autistic people often will see the... I don't know, genius or the skills or the talents of other autistic people. And meanwhile, there are a lot of people that were probably dismissing Banneker. Oh, he's just an almanac writer. Like, why is he going to come in and do this? He's just an almanac writer. And I, I don't know how you feel about autistic only play groups. But I know for me, when I'm with other autistic people, it's just like, you can relax, you see each other, you don't have to explain shit. I bet Banneker didn't need to, like, accuse Jefferson of not having enough eye contact. He was probably fine with it. They were probably sitting in the same room reading books to each other, reading their own books, reading books, like, now we stare at our phones next to each other. So... This idea of autistics kind of having, let's call it empathy for other autistics, this is another fundamental concept of autistic. You want to talk about double empathy? Oh, man, the double empathy. So there, there have been studies, lots and lots of studies, where one of, so back in the day, one of the defining characteristics, and even to this day for some people who are uneducated, is that autistic people, the belief that autistic people don't have empathy. It's sort and, of what Alexander Hamilton was saying when exactly. he's like Jefferson's dishonest. Like, I just don't get a good feeling about that guy. He doesn't have, like, he doesn't have empathy. He doesn't, he's just focused on himself. He's selfish. He's narcissistic. And this, this is a common, yeah, th this is a common, holistic, uh, erroneous belief because studies have shown that holistic researchers, when interacting with autistic people, because they misread our natural body language, they misread our natural tone, they misread our autistic accents, they, they erroneously believe that we don't have empathy because it turns out they did not have empathy for us. Bam! And this is what is called the double empathy problem, because if you don't have empathy for someone else, it's difficult to believe that they have empathy for you. And we actually have what is called hyper empathy because of our hyper connected brains. We have uh, these things called mirror neurons that uh, facilitate socialization. Everyone has them, but our mirror neurons are hyper connected. And when we have empathy, we have empathy so strong that it can be overpowering so strong that it may result in us accidentally downloading parts of other people's personalities and integrating them into our own mm. because that is we, we respect them and we want to be more like them uh, there's a lot of people who even do this with fictional characters and so closely identify with these fictional people w which we call fiction kin that they change attributes of themselves to be more like these people that they idolize. I was this... reading, uh, I was reading, this happens to me a lot, but I was reading a book that I just like felt totally, totally in love with. Um, and I noticed my writing, I started sounding like I was in that book. Like my writing wasn't my writing. I was writing like that author. I, I, I was doing that same thing while uh, rereading a uh, series of unfortunate events and oh. I frequently have been reusing the phrase, a word which here means, because yeah. I love the way that he describes things. Yeah. Strongly suspect that Lemony Snicket is autistic, but that's a topic for another day. Oh, well, let's do that one. So, yeah, so basically what happens is Jefferson, like, sees Banneker. He's like, this dude gets it. 
in a way that autistic people and why I think it's so fun for us to hang out here in Autistica and having you in our world on this show is autistic people can see what's awesome about other autistic people sometimes faster because we're not thrown off by these um, sonar signals that work in the neurotypical world uh, better. Um, so we see each other. So he gets this dude in and he's like, you're going to design the city. You're going to design the layout. So I want to tell you why I love this. First of all, like many autistics, I am a terrible driver. Like I'm just not, it's not my forte. I feel the same way. Yes. Mm. But DC makes it super easy to drive if you get the system. So oh, there's it's a system. pattern matching. Is totally pattern matching. I would say there are many people that have lived in D.C. for 30, 40, 50 years and never got the pattern. I got the pattern on day one. It made me fall in love with the city. And here's how it goes. So the capital is at the center. And there's four quadrants. And all four quadrants are mirrors. So if you picture like a butterfly's wings, the four quadrants are different sizes, but they're identical. And First Street and A Street cross. So the A Streets run north to south and the, uh, I'm sorry, run east to west. And the uh, numbered streets run north to south. And they go out in a pattern. And the first basically 26 blocks are A through Z. The next 26 blocks are are one syllable words starting with the letter. The next 26 blocks are two syllable words. The next 26 blocks are three syllable words. So you always know where you are if you look at the quadrant, the street, and the number of syllables in that street name. And then, stroke of genius, we needed streets that run on diagonals. And so all the streets on diagonals are laid are named after states. Oh. And so so Pennsylvania Avenue is a street you might know in my town. So there's First Street, there's A Street, and then there's avenues, Pennsylvania Avenue, Connecticut Avenue, Wisconsin Avenue, and all those streets run on diagonals. The diagonals connect up with more circles, it's like a fucking fractal. The circles, just like the circle at the Capitol. So that is all brilliant. over this, it's so good. You can't get lost. Uh, people do, don't get me wrong. But if you know the system, as soon as you see the pattern, it's like nature represented through the way the streets are built. And there's this tiny little weird corner, ironically, where I used to live, where there are like five streets and they didn't want to go to four syllable names. So they put in some trees, but they're trees in alphabetical order. So I lived off of Aspen and then there's Butternut and then there's Cedar and then there's Dahlia. So we have a few street names at the end when they ran out of uh, four syllable words, I guess. I just love that at some point there was an autistic person saying, quick, 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 what's a tree that starts with F? Correct. Yes, th mm -hmm. this is so good. Yeah, you got to visit. We're going to look at the street maps. Now, here's a fun one. My, um, well, this is one of my favorite things. This is much disputed, but there is no J Street in Washington, D.C. That's now, interesting. It is. But if you'll remember the way the letter I is written, ah. I, like I, and then we also have the issue of the letter L which can also look like an I. So their original plan was to not have an I street because of the L street issue and to just have a J street. It would sort of double for both of them. So they were going to have I street and J street double over. But at the time, the Supreme Court justice was this total colostomy bag of a guy named John Jay. <laughs> <laughs> no one liked John Jay. So our guy Banneker gets in there and he's like, eh, I can't have I and J Street. Let's just go with I Street. Killed J Street and thereby giving John Jay the perfect autistic fuck you. 
<laughs> that is brilliant. It's a wow. good one. We'll get our little social justice vibes in there where we can get them. Very nice. Mm-hmm. And usually, you know, like a little bit of creativity and intelligence, uh, yeah, is the way to do this. So uh, I love that Benjamin Banneker was protesting the Supreme Court. And my son actually goes to school on I Street. Uh, he goes to school at 19 I Street, and it's always spelled E-Y-E, even though it's just the letter I, so you don't confuse it with L Street and go to the wrong address. So that's how we've that's how we've adapted it, but every time I pull up to 19 I, I remember John Jay, we got some Supreme Court issues of our own right now, and autistics have been taking uh, unfairness on the courts to task since all the way back in the 1700s when we were building Washington, D.C. That is a fantastic legacy to have. Yeah, so if you find yourself in D.C. and you cruise by I Street or you wonder why, like, a hotel or a restaurant spells I Street, E-Y-E, the reason for that is because we are all on board protesting Jonathan Jay's uh, fascist ideas from that bench. So let's go. Uh, and I want to, that brings me back to social justice and this, uh, obviously lots of empathy between Jefferson and Banneker. They really got each other. Banneker was doing these almanacs year after year, and he would send these almanacs first, the first read, he would send them to Jefferson often unedited to get Jefferson's feedback on his almanacs. They were very close. And in August, uh, August 19th of 1791, Banneker made a heartfelt plea as a free black man. Uh, he really just didn't get, he's like, dude, I know you get this. Why don't you just free your slaves? And Jefferson did person. get it. He did get it, but he couldn't figure out how to do it. And this is very colonial. But Jefferson's position was like, if we just free these people, they will not know how to take care of themselves. They're just not smart enough. They're not intelligent enough. They don't have the capacity. And Banneker was like, dude, have we met? Like, this does not make sense. And they were both men of God, and which is, you know, very of the time. And he's like, we both believe in God. We both believe in science. We know that people are created equal. And might I remind you, Banneker says in this letter, you were the one who wrote in the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal. So I know you know this. Could you please step up? So there are so many gems. I'm going to put this whole letter in the show notes. I'm going to have you read one small passage. I don't even think it's the best passage. They're all good. And um, this is Banneker pleading with Jefferson to not only free his slaves, but change the law. Now, sir. If this is founded in truth, I apprehend you will readily embrace every opportunity to eradicate that train of absurd and false ideas and opinions which so generally prevails with respect to us, and that your sentiments are concurrent with mine, which are that one universal Father hath given being to us all, and that he hath not only made us all of one flesh, but he hath also without partiality, afforded us all the same sensations, and imbued us all with the same faculties, and that however variable we may be in the society or religion, however diversified in situation or color, we are all of the same family and stand in the same relation to him. That's a great speech. Seriously makes me want to cry. I feel that way like right now, like, like Benjamin, yes. I so feel you here. He's like, come on. So Thomas Jefferson gets this letter, and I'm going to tell you, he knows Banneker is right. He has no leg to stand on. Banneker comes at him from every angle. I know my friends and family hate fighting with me because I can see every angle and head it off at the pass. 
Nobody ever wins a fight with me. They hate that about me. But now you've got two of the smartest guys having this argument with each other. And Thomas Jefferson, his response was, I know you're right, but I don't know what to do about it. He says, "Interesting. I have hope for the appearance of such proofs that you exhibit that nature has endowed blacks with talents equal to those of other colors of men and that their in their apparent absence among most people but by the way not you cuz i think you're smart was the result of the degraded condition of their existence both in africa and america you think yeah he also informed Banneker that he was uh, that he was sending uh, messengers to France that were against slavery, and he said maybe we can fight this in France, and it could be used to redeem blacks against doubts which have been entertained of them. Like I got friends in France, we'll deal with it there. It's kind of messy for me here, but. The fact he took this stance is what led to a major election problem for him. And this mirrors some of the stuff happening in our politics right now. So Jefferson says, I see that in theory, maybe it's just their conditions that are making them so terrible. We've got some hope that we can prove out your theory. We're going to do a little proof of concept in France. All of the slave owners that were considering voting for him got super nervous. So these were the Southern Federalists. And the Southern Federalists start this political campaign that nearly brought Jefferson down. He almost lost this campaign. It was a tiebreaker. It was broken in Congress. And the issue was that his response to Banneker indicated that he favored, quote, a speedy emancipation of the slaves. We can't get this dude in. He, we can't let him win. He supports black people. A white supremacist campaign against Jefferson, who didn't even do what Banneker said. Like he did the shittiest possible little response. I'm going to send a guy to France to suggest maybe this could be true there. Yeah, the, the phrase, let's try it in France first. I'm, I'm going to use that every time I turn people down from now on. Yeah, let's try it in France. For, we'll do a little yeah. pilot study in France. Exactly. Thanks for listening to the Autistic Culture Podcast. We'll be right back. When autistic people find a special interest, they go deep and have a lot of knowledge, even if they don't have that formal education background to go with it. If you want to capture your spin in a book, check out Angela's work at differencepress.com. Difference press.com and find out more about becoming an author and establishing your credibility with a book the people who are in power fear losing power the people who are dehumanized uh if 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 given power might change uh the, the people who currently run things and i would say like jefferson here is really good at masking Yes. He really wants to be president. He gets that he's weird. He gets he's socially awkward. He knows Hamilton thinks he's dishonest. But he is like putting up his best front possible and trying to stay true. I mean, I'm not, like, I'm not trying to be an apologist for Jefferson, but masking messes us up a little. Like, yes. I know I've made some decisions that were out of integrity because I was trying to fit in or maybe I wanted a job. And Jefferson wanted this job. I think he probably thought I could change things more from the inside. And I'm not going to get this job if I tell him, hey, this makes no sense. We got to end slavery and we got to end it today. And if there's a war, there's a war. We can handle it despite the fact we just had the revolution. He was like, I'm not going to get the job that way. I want the damn job. Yeah, the, the masking is a killer of the self. Because if you can't be who you truly are because you're afraid of repercussions from other people, especially if he's already got the discrimination against him because of being odd or unsociable or not making eye contact, that that leads to people making a lot of hurtful decisions in order for self-preservation. Yeah. 
Yeah, and inconsistencies, in lack of integrity, then that further the dishonesty thing. Like, first I thought you were dishonest because you weren't making eye contact, and now you're telling Benjamin Banneker, let's go do a study of are black people actually smart and equal humans in France, but now you're talking out of both sides of your mouth because you're trying to tell us you're not trying to end slavery in Virginia. Like, what are you doing, dude? You are dishonest. And then people get, they create this whole story around who you are based on, which isn't necessarily wrong. Yeah, because if you're masking, you're trying to be all things to all people rather than being true to yourself. Yeah. And... Banneker didn't have that problem in the same way because he didn't have the same opportunities Jefferson had. So when we look at autistic culture uh, and people who have um, other differences in addition to autism, so people that are black with autism, brown, queer people like me with autism, all of those other differences combine, and we talk about intersectionalism, um, to give you a different perspective. So Jefferson, rich white dude with autism, looks a lot different, and his masking skills are different. Women and masking are different. White women and masking are different. Like All those differences, all those intersections of our differences make how we show up as autistics different. So one of my favorite things to remember as we enter the land of autistica is if you've met one autistic people, you've met one autistic person. So that is, uh, that's part of why we all have lots of things we're bringing to the table. And I think that double empathy without double empathy, we would not have Washington DC the way it is without the autistic brilliance of order and symmetry. We would not have the most beautifully laid out city. I can't wait to get you here and show you around. Uh, autistic overworking, maybe, like we dive into the books. You would not have Benjamin Banneker's prolific almanacs and his um, work of astrology and math and architecture. And by the way, all of those amazing things that Jefferson did too, his incredible library at Monticello. We love working because our special interests, there's not a work-life balance, there's a special interests and executive function balance we have problems with. <laughs> I have enough trouble remembering to go to the bathroom when I'm reading. And so, all of these incredible things layered with that sense of social justice that is vibrant on every single corner in Washington, D.C. So that is why I make my case to you. Washington, D.C. is autistic. What do you think, Matt? Have I convinced you? <laughs> that is beautiful. The idea of such a well laid out system I find incredibly satisfying and soothing because knowing that everything was so well planned and so well laid out and so well executed, uh, I, I salute him as a brilliant member of our people. Yes. So uh, when we actually map the terrain of Autistica, Benjamin Banneker, we will have you on our team, Autistic Culture Mapping with Lovely Order and Symmetry uh, contributions uh, from Jefferson and Banneker um, to making Washington, D.C. the amazing city it still is while it's standing. We'll see how much longer <laughs> before science fiction becomes reality here. So that's what I wanted to share with you. I love my city and I wanted to bring a little of that to you. The minute I got to Washington, D.C., um, I knew I was going to move here. I was doing college tours. I was looking everywhere. I landed in Foggy Bottom and I was on uh, the campus of George Washington University for 30 seconds before I was like, this is my home. At the time, I had not been diagnosed yet. I wasn't diagnosed till I was 39. And I think part of why I felt so at home in the energy of Washington, D.C. is it's always made sense to me. And because it is such an autistic city. So that's what I got for you. That is fantastic. Love it. 
Well, that is our episode. Uh, I love uh, exploring these issues with you, Matt. And uh, what I have for you is one final question today, which is what is one thing this week that you loved about being autistic? I love the ability and freedom and desire to do research because mm. I I embrace data hunger. I embrace learning new things and I feel satisfied having filled my brain with brand new nuggets of information. Yum, yum, yum. Well, if you love nuggets of information, make sure that you stay tuned for our next episode. We love having you here on the Autistic Culture Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Autistic Culture Podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. And remember, no one ever changed the world by being like everyone else. You can find out more about writing your book with me at differencepress.com. That's Difference, D-I-F-F-E-R-E-N-C-E, press, P-R-E-S-S dot com. Or getting a psychological evaluation or consult with me at www.mattlowrylpp.com. That's M-A-T-T, Matt Lowry, L-O-W-R-Y, L-P-P, as in Licensed Psychological Practitioner dot com.